Hi, this is Amy with a Y, and we're doing a little bit of a bonus episode today with Marissa Alexa McCool. Actually, I may need to change that, but why don't you introduce yourself, Marissa, using the correct name, since I'm bad at this. Oh, no. um, introduce yourself, tell us about your podcast, and yeah. That name's fine. Uh, you know, uh, it's still the name I use for my books and appearances and everything, so I don't mind being introduced that way. I host the Sister Getting Out of Hand podcast. Uh, I'll be starting a new one with my partner Murph pretty soon called But I Heard About It. I'm a blogger on Free Thoughts. I just released my ninth book called Tinder Profile Poetry. And I do other shit too, probably. Yeah, I'm sure you you do lots of other shit. We all do a <laughs> ton of shit, don't we? Yeah. Um, so Marissa and I are here because we just did... Marissa wrote a... A radio play, a Christmas radio play for Atheist Talk that I got to be a main character in, which was amazing. And one of the themes that ran throughout that was um, little hat tips to the show Fargo. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't, I'd seen the entire show before and I loved it, but I hadn't rewatched it in several years. So I recently just sat and binged the entire thing, episode one to the last episode in season three. And remembered why I loved it so much. Right. And I just really wanted to geek out with somebody about it because <laughs> I was like, I need all these things and now I need to talk about them. And so we thought we'd just kind of do this little bonus thing here where we just geek out about Fargo and see where it goes, I guess. Right, right. Um, I, kept, I kept thinking, well, I was going to say, I kept thinking while I was watching it, I want to hear Marissa's, like if there's any conspiracy ideas or themes that I'm missing or just, you know, Easter eggs or that kind of stuff. Oh, there's a ton of them. There's so many. Uh, and full disclosure, I have listened the whole way through to three different Fargo podcasts. So like, I'm not, I oh my gosh. just watched the show probably six times, but I've listened to the entirety of multiple podcasts that cover every episode <laughs> of the season. So it's, not only my favorite show, but one of the things I think I like most about it is it's like three different little shows. That it really it, is, yeah, yeah. Because you know, it, they they have little to nothing to do with each other except some plot elements and characters, and that that really gives it the feel of it's like you're watching a completely different show, and I think that adds a lot to it. Well, yeah, and I noticed like season two is shot so differently from season one, just the way that they do the shots um, and they do a lot of that. I don't know what it's called, but they have, you know, two people in one shot. They have it side by side and it, it looks so cool in the second season, but it's something they didn't do in the first or third. And I just, it's so well written and so interesting. And the thing that surprised me about liking the show is that I hated the movie so much. And to be fair, I only ever saw the movie, I think, one time. And that was when it came out in the theater back in the 90s. And it was a big deal around here because, you know, I'm in Minnesota. and mm -hmm. um, So, yeah, it was at the time it was huge. Everybody was going to see it. We were having Fargo-themed parties. It was, you know. And I went with my best friend. We went to see it. And I remember us walking out, looking at each other, going, what? was that <laughs> like I don't know what it was we expected but we were just like everybody walking out of the theater was silent and we were all looking at each other like um and I think the thing that really bothered all of us was just the overextended accents you know like we all have this Minnesota accent but then the movie just takes it up a notch and to hear it that way is just so strange for us because we don't hear our own accents to begin with, but then when you hear it back to you in this amplified way, it was just like, oh, oh my God, is that what we sound like? Like, you just get sidetracked with that and not the story of the of the movie. Yeah. To, so, yeah, when the show came out, it took a lot of convincing to get me to watch it. And to be fair, I've only seen the movie once, and I only watched it after I watched the show. But I think if there is a defense of that, it's that there are groups of people with accents that have to deal with that much more often. I think the way mm -hmm. that people from the Midwest, especially uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, feel about that is the way British people feel about American actors doing British accents 
except all the time. Like I, I feel like I, that's that a, makes sense. It's it's like a micro version of something that they just don't, mm-hmm. you know, that that certain groups deal with all the time. And I think there's something to the fact that uh, the Cohens specifically chose the Midwest because it's not an area that typically gets a lot of play in a mainstream movie. And I'm not a big fan of the movie itself either. And I'm kind of glad I saw the show first because I might not have seen the show if I watched the movie first. Because I think everything that annoys me about the Coens is in the movie Fargo. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I feel like what Noah Hawley and the makers of the show did was take a lot of the best things about not just Fargo, but Cohen movies in general, but then write it differently, have a lot of different actors instead of the same actors over and over again, and have uh, a, a lot of philosophical elements really play their way into it. Yeah, I my brother is a big Cohen. My brother's just kind of a an indie film nerd to begin with. That's his whole he's like I am with Broadway only with independent film and he writes screenplays that are very quirky and so he loves the Cohens and loved the movie. So when the show came out, he was like you got to watch this show. It's so good and I just went, yeah, it's one of your nerd things. I'm not I don't take his recommendations. Um, because they're usually just, I, I fell asleep once at a movie that he recommended for me. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not watching this show. You have weird taste, but finally he's like, I don't know. I got to tell you, it's really good. And then other people started telling me they liked it. And I ran out of shows to watch and I'm like, all right, fuck it. I'm just going to sit down and see what this is about. And by the end of episode one, I was just, I was all in. Mm-hmm. It was like, yes, this is amazing. Just the story of it is, and they do a similar story in season one as is what's in the movie, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's so extended and so much better. And the characters are amazing. And yeah, I, um, I, I can't even say that I have a favorite season at this point. Like I just, I just finished watching all of them and they each have their own unique thing that I don't know. Do you have a favorite season? Do you have a favorite episode? Like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say in order, uh, my favorite seasons are two, three, and one. Um, I feel like season one is derivative of the movie, but it was kind of also getting its feet wet at the same time. And I feel mm-hmm. like seasons two and three, they took, some of the problems with the first season corrected them and then made them better. So like one of the biggest issues with season one is there's only one really woman character that does anything. Mm -hmm. And they, they answer that by having season two just filled with amazing women. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then season three has probably the two best women characters, Gloria Burgle and Nikki Swango. So it, it feels like it gets better each time, but it's also so different from each other yeah um yeah and it's yeah and yet there's still the basic elements of Mm -hmm. you know the basic storyline and the basic amount of violence and the but the way that they're able to do that so differently each time is amazing to me yeah, and it looks like season four is going to have little to nothing to do with the previous three. Which I know. Really <laughs> I saw, I you know, once I finished watching, I went and looked to see, you know, is, is there a season four coming out? Oh, my God, I need to know this. And so I went and read what I could about season four. But it says it takes place in Saint, or in Kansas City, which I get because Kansas City mob is a big part of all of this. Mm-hmm. But then I thought if it doesn't take place in Minnesota... Is it really still Fargo? I don't know. I'm sure it will be great no matter what they do. But I'm just wondering how they're going to kind of pull together the narrative. I, I guess season three didn't have as much to do with the other two seasons as the first two did with each other. But I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm worried. I really want to love it. So, Well, it took Noah like two, three years to come up with. So I feel like in all that's that time... True. You know, he, he's been able to, to find a story that works for him. Um, my theory is that it's going to connect to season two more than anything. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, the base is Kansas City. So in season right. two, we have the Kansas City mob showing up and messing with the Gerhards who are in actual Fargo, not Minnesota Fargo. Right. And uh, 
uh, you know, the, the main character is going to be played by uh, Chris Rock. And I mm-hmm. feel like that's going to be some kind of connection to like Mike Milligan's origin story or something. Yes. And yeah. I, I feel like we're going to see the roots of the, uh, the Gerhardt, uh, Kansas city feud. I feel like we're going to get mm-hmm. to go back in, maybe see Lou as a kid or somehow small town Minnesota gets involved with it, which is why hmm. he seems to know his way around different kinds of people, or at the very least be suspicious oh. of them. Or maybe right. we'll see a, a young Hank, uh, the, the, what's his name? Um, Oh, his name's escaping Hank, me. The, the cheers remember. guy. What's his name? Oh, Oh, Ted um, Danson. Ted Danson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we might see a young Ted Danson get involved somehow. So, you know, the, the season two is like post Vietnam, you know, all of these former soldiers sort of dealing with their own uh, PTSD and issues that uh, Ted Danson even says it. I think some of the, sometimes I think those you, you brought that war home with you. And I feel like mm-hmm. that might be similar, except WW2. So, yeah, it might just be a that different could, dynamic. It's very interesting. And Mike Milligan is either my favorite character or one of my top favorite characters i just loved watching him just the way he talks to people and the his conversations he has and Mm -hmm. i just every time he was on the screen i was just enthralled by whatever he was doing and not because he's a good guy like he's he's not my favorite character as far as who i think a hero is but just such a fascinating character so to be able to see kind of how he started out maybe would be really really cool yeah yeah Um, because because he's got this very odd like shakespearean kind of thing going on yes and uh the interesting dichotomy with him uh besides the fact that he just you know is quick with a joker to light up your smoke is the fact that (laughs) you know he's often paired with simone who Mm -hmm. is a character who is obsessed with television references Uh, she makes references to alice and, uh, you know, several other TV shows that were popular at the time. So you kind of have this pop culture versus historical literature contrast going on. And it's really mm-hmm. interesting. And It is, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. What I really like about the show in general is it doesn't matter who the good guys and bad guys are for the most part. It's that even the worst of the worst bad guys are so interesting that you yes. still want to see more of them, even if you want them to lose in the end. Yeah, like even if you want to see them die or go to jail, you want to watch as much of it as you can before that happens because they're, you know, like Mike Milligan is just, like you said, the Shakespearean thing and he's always smarter than the person he's talking to and just kind of watching that play out and um, in season one, you know, there's always Billy Bob Thornton, his character in season one, just a horrible person, but... Fan, just fascinating to see everything that he does and what his plans are and how he's planned things out. And yeah, I, the writing, I keep thinking the writing must take forever because it's so intricate. And um, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you have a favorite character? Like a, but well, I guess I asked you that already. Nikki Swango and Gloria Burgle. I wanted to know what you thought about the ending of season one. And by the way, all the spoilers, if you haven't seen all of Fargo, just go back and watch it because yeah. we're not do we're not saving any spoilers. But the end of season one, there was some controversy because um, the oh God, what was the main character's name? Now I can't remember her. It was Molly. The, Molly, yes, because um, Molly basically didn't get to be the hero at the end. She didn't get to have the big um incident with the bad guy and she basically they kind of made it that she got saved by a man that really that should have been hers to deal with and i don't know in rewatching it that that did kind of bug me again like she got cheated out of her i don't know what do do you think that that's the case or do you think it was really fairly done the way they ended it i think the fact that she was the only prominent female character had a lot to do with that but if you if you really think about it, she didn't have a storyline with Malvo, and Gus did. Like, Gus gets punked out by him in the first episode, and then Gus is the one that takes That's him true. to jail and gets, you know, uh, shit for it. And he's the one who's tracking him, and, you know, it just shakes up his life so much. 
and I think they were going for bittersweet, um, mm. you know, because it was sort of an updated version of the movie. And the movie is kind of paint by numbers in terms of plot, you know, hero right. saves the day. But at the same mm-hmm. time, at the very end, you know, you have the couple in mm-hmm. bed and one of them's just like, well, I guess I got to go to work tomorrow. And the other's like, I got a three cent stamp. Cool. And like, I, I really feel like yeah. they're going for that. So it makes storyline sense that Gus is the one that tracks him down because Gus is the one that had multiple interactions with him. But given that the only other, like, I think named female character mm-hmm. was, uh, well, you had the, the, Greta? the, the wives, but Greta, what a great char- side character. Oh, too. she was so great. Um, and I love how they blended that family so seamlessly by the end of it. And she was, I would love to see some sort of update on Greta and what she ended up doing. And mm-hmm. I think that would make for an entirely interesting season all on its own. Um, do you dig into some, I don't want to say conspiracy theories, but maybe just fan theories about things or things that the rest of us probably missed when we were just basically enjoying the show. Um, what do you have just just launch into some interesting stuff that we may not know if we have just watched Fargo and haven't thought a ton about all of the underlying stuff. Not well, to put you on the spot, but no, be, no. be brilliant with it. So. <laughs> I am more than willing to talk about this for hours. <laughs> Please well, do. Uh, one of the biggest things is pay attention to the episode names. They all matter. Um, and some of them are really direct and you can see how they matter, but others are not and you can really speculate. Uh, for instance, uh, in season three, there's, uh, I believe it's episode four, uh, they, they line the characters up with Peter and the wolf, the, the, the music. Yes. Um, and each of the characters that they line up ends up pretty much exactly like the end of the season. Um, you know, really? in, in the, first, the first season, you have a lot more of a, a philosophy thing going on. There's a lot of different... Mm-hmm. Um, Uh, Things like that, like uh, the second episode of the first season is called The Rooster Prince, which is Mm -hmm. uh, a tale of a a prince who thinks he's a rooster and nobody can get him to stop. And this person comes in and just starts acting like a rooster with him and then slowly teaches him how to be a human as another rooster. Like it's it's one of those philosophical things, but you can you can kind of see that with Lester and Malvo. Who, you mm-hmm. know, Lester's just kind of this bumbling, awkward, nervous guy who probably is playing that up a little bit so he doesn't have to yeah. try. And then you have Malvo almost being a person who tutors him how to be an awful person. And by the by the end of the season, uh, the, the, the student beats the teacher. So um, there's so yeah. many different... You know, just look at every episode title. Uh, Mm -hmm. season three is particularly interesting because it uses a lot of the rules of bridge. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things going on there. I suppose that was such a big plot or through line in that season was the bridge thing. And Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to play bridge, but (laughs) I'm sure if I learned more, it would be fascinating. I, I don't know. My favorite I would say theory overall is mm-hmm. that the um, season three and I'm going to, I'm going to look up exactly what it is cause I'm blanking on it, but it's basically sure. the idea uh, that rule that things can not be and be at the same time. Uh, and I believe uh, the Ray fine, okay. not Ray fine, uh, Ray wise character plays it, you know, mm-hmm. mentions that he tells the story where, um, there's a person who is both divorced and not divorced at the same time. The law of non-contradiction, that's what it's called. And okay. the whole season has that because Gloria is chief, but not chief. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. She, she's divorced, but not divorced because she takes mm-hmm. forever to sign it. Uh, VM yeah. Varga, it, you know, he's just a series of contradictions. And, oh yeah, you know, the whole idea of, like everything that happens in that season is just playing on that. Uh, you know, even even the scene they have in the bowling alley, which is some kind of purgatory. So they're dead, but mm-hmm. not dead. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, th- that's a really interesting one too. So um, for people who enjoy well, like, 
philosophical stuff like that. Well, I I did notice, I'm sure the first time around, but also the second time around in season three, they, they make so much of Gloria not being able to use anything electronic, you know, like nothing electronic wants to work for her. The computers never mm-hmm. want to work. The motion sensors don't see her. And so you get this whole thing where it's like she's invisible or she's not there. And, you know, they kind of resolve that by the end of it. But that was just an interesting way to to go about it. The faucets don't work because she can't do any of the motion sensor stuff. And I thought it's interesting, but I didn't... I didn't know precisely kind of why that was in there, but when you describe when you describe it the way you just did, it makes a lot more sense that she's there, but she's not actually she's not actually there. That's ew. what mm-hmm. do you think of um, in season three? So the her step grandfather. Well, that's another thing. He's her dad, but not really her dad. Um, the way that he is killed and the way that this other guy pulls it off is by gluing his nose and his mouth shut and number one i couldn't tell that's what had happened when i saw it until someone brought it up i just it never would have occurred to me looking at that to go oh that's what happened his face got glued shut Mm -hmm. like do you think there's anything to that or why they chose that or you know what's behind that particular method of killing Mm -hmm. somebody well, you have the, the twist later that Varga and his goons sort of go kill a bunch of people named Stussy using those multiple methods. And the, th- and mm-hmm. the thing about that method is it's very easy to recreate uh, as opposed yeah. to just happening to find someone on the street and kicking an air conditioner on their head. So right. asphyxiating someone via glue is mm-hmm. a lot easier to pull off than some of the other clever methods that we've seen to off people on right. this show. So I, I, I don't think there's much to that, except that, uh, that that was probably just something that was really easy to replicate. Yeah, and it made it kind of an interesting, catchy, you know. Yeah, I, I'm i really not a person who likes tons of, like, graphic violence on TV. Like, I love crime shows. I love that kind of shit. But actually seeing gore, seeing violence has never really been my thing. But on this show, I just... I don't know. The way they do it is just so amazing. I know in season two, um, when, oh God, what's his name? Hansi. Yes. Goes out and just, just mows down this group of rednecks at a bar. And, (laughs) you know, normally I would be like, oh God, but I'm just watching it go, yes, shoot him some more, you know, like, (laughs) and he's doing an objectively bad thing, but. I get it. And I like him as a character. And it's another one of those things where he's not really a good guy, but it doesn't matter because the things, the choices he makes are so interesting that I just want to, I just want to see more of it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's, he's a really interesting character. And I think uh, what's really good about that is there's the trope of the uh, native American muscle, right? Mm -hmm. The the bodyguard, the person, the tracker, and, right. You know, or the that, strong and silent, you know. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. sort of set you up to expect that. But then, mm-hmm. like, in the last third of the season, they make him such a dynamic character with multiple motivations who shows yeah. vulnerability. And I think that was a, a, a really interesting twist to it and uh, definitely made the season better. Oh, yeah, for sure. I The scene with him and the haircut... Just mm-hmm. wanting that you're just, it's like you're on the edge of your seat watching it going, what's, oh my God, what's going to happen? And you can see that humanity come out in him. Um, I loved it when they just shot, what's his name? The fucking guy they had tied up. I can't remember everybody's Dodd. names now. Cause they're, yeah, Dodd. Oh my God. I was so happy when he died. But <laughs> there's, and there's so many, you know, in all of the seasons, I think these dynamics between brothers and families and, um, you know, I guess not so much in season one, but in season two and season three, there's just a lot of brother dynamics or sibling dynamics. Um, Do you think that's kind of intentional? Oh, yeah. And there's some in season one, too. You have Lester and his brother. You have the Hess and... Oh, I forgot his brother. That's right. You know, yes, you have multiple... Like, Fargo's season one kind of has like two storylines. And then Mm -hmm. season two has about 20 
And mm-hmm. <laughs> season three has three yeah. or four. So, uh, you know, some of the things got expanded. Yeah. No, I completely forgot Lester had that fucking brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And those two knucklehead kids. That, mm-hmm. Oh, they're just, oh my God, they're so bad. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about, I can't, I remember watching the beginning of season two and um, so now remind me of the season two main characters. Kirsten Dunst, her name is, um, oh, I can't remember now. You get, Yeah, you gotta Google it because now I can't. Lynn? No. Gloria? No, that was season no. three. Um, season three. I remember the actor's name. Uh, Peggy oh, yeah. Quist, that's it. And Peggy, then, yes, Peggy and Ed would be Peggy your husband then. Yeah. And yeah, what's funny is those two actors are married now and together. <laughs> That's but, amazing. Um, yeah, but just the whole thing with her hitting the guy and then driving home, <laughs> that that still, I can't, I can't quite wrap my brain around that or make that even, you know, I know the whole thing isn't meant to be super realistic, but that one thing I just thought, really? I I don't know. That kind of brought me out of the story a little bit. But I get that they had to set up the entire thing by them doing this one act. And But yeah, think about it, though. This is a character who is impulsive. This is mm-hmm. someone who makes rash decisions without thinking about it. And who is also trapped in a world she doesn't want to be in, in a relationship she really doesn't want to be in. So Mm -hmm. you have someone who's kind of going on autopilot, just desperate to get out and be somebody uh, who who doesn't really make the best decisions. And even all throughout the season, like Ed's cleaning up her mess and just trying to survive and they get out by the skin of their teeth. So, yeah, I feel like Peggy Blumquist of all characters would be the one who would do something like that. Like if Betsy Salverson did that, you'd be like, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. (laughs) Yeah, I you're you're totally right. Yeah, the watching season two and watching, you know, the Selverson storyline and Molly is a little girl and her mom and you know what's going to happen to her mom and just oh god, watching that is it gets so heartbreaking by the end because you realize what an interesting and dynamic character she was mm-hmm. and you know oftentimes when they have that storyline where you know it's just me and dad mom died of cancer you never really know much about that other absent parent but they made her so real and so you know she had all these different facets and she was a great detective and she you know she was just a very interesting person and I like that you got to kind of go back and see that and it made it even more sad you know that she was gone and then they had to grow up without her and I don't know I so much of the parenting stuff in this show too is just very bittersweet and interesting to watch I don't know oh, I agree with you uh you know you take Lou Salverson for instance you know he's a he's the grown-up parent in season one and you can mm-hmm. kind of see him not interfering with what Molly does but suggesting maybe she not do something and Right. In, and then in season two, you've got him and you would think he would be the, you know, ultimate badass and whatever. And really, he's kind of clueless. Uh, yeah. It's, it's Betsy, who's the smart one, who figures out a mm-hmm. lot of the stuff. So and then you have uh, Ted Danson, who is, you know, Molly's parent. And mm-hmm. uh, it's it's and then the, the Gerhardt kids, uh, all of them and their yeah. dynamic with their mother, uh, Jean Smart. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, is she awesome? <laughs> oh, she was amazing in this show. She's amazing anyway, but man, she was phenomenal in this role. It, yeah. I, there's just so many, they do such a good job of really fleshing out all of the characters um, so that you want to know more about every single one of them. And, you know, one thing I was, as I was watching it, I'm like, okay, this, I was trying to kind of make mental notes. Like, I need to ask Marissa about this one. So the, the UFO Mm -hmm. in season two, what was up with that? Like, is that just meant to be a big symbolic thing? Are we meant to believe that they hallucinated it? Is it supposed to actually be a UFO? Um, Is this a world where they exist? What, what's your thoughts and take on that? 
All right. Well, first of all, all three seasons have kind of a supernatural element to it somehow. Like the first mm-hmm. one, Lauren Malvo is almost a mythical character with how much he's able to get away with and what he's able to accomplish. And, you know, season three, uh, it's much more te- technology and other, you know, other things like that. And you have purgatory in it and yeah. people coming back from the dead to avenge people. But season two, if you rewatch it and pay attention to the details, almost every single episode has a reference to aliens. Uh, really? Have, um, right before he gets hit by the car, the youngest Gerhardt sees the UFO in the sky. When Yeah, I remember that. When Hansi's tracking uh, in in the waffle shop, he sees a UFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, the, in the South Dakota gas station, there's bumper stickers and stickers on the wall that say, we are not alone, aliens are coming. There's the conversation mm-hmm. that, that Lou has at the gas station where it's like, oh yeah, the aliens are coming, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And... What what it turns out is that this is actually based on one of the most credible UFO stories there are about a sheriff in Minnesota around 1979 who saw what he saw, what he thought was a UFO or something was a bright flashing light and then mm. he blacked out and when he came to his car was burned but his car clock and his watch were 20 minutes off Oh my gosh. So, um, you know, 19, with the 1979 season, they're playing on a mm-hmm. lot of different things that were taking place at the time. And UFO hysteria was really huge around here at the time. Yeah. And that was one of the pinnacle examples of it. So, hmm. you know, they, they set up Fargo to be like this hyper realistic world, but it's really not in many ways. Um, to use a more fantastical example, you have a show like Game of Thrones that tries mm-hmm. to be very realistic for the most part and then use the magic at the big parts. And Fargo's just not that far, of course, but yeah. you, you have real characters, real events, real places, but also some mythical elements, some philosophical <laughs> elements. So, um, you know, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, come on. But then also yeah. when you rewatch it. It's like, yeah, they were telling you that was going to happen the whole time. Yeah. Wow. I, I do remember, you know, at the very beginning, Rye looking out and seeing the lights and thinking, okay, they're, they're making you think it's a UFO, but it'll turn out that it's something else and it'll be this big play. And then to get to the end and just see the UFO and then nobody really talks about it. Or <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It really, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it now and look for all the references because yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah. When you're looking um, for them, you really see it. It's, it's not every episode, but it's close that there's some kind of hint that that's what's going to happen. Um, even, I don't remember if it's episode one or two, but they, they play the song Children of the Sun, which is a song about mm-hmm. aliens coming to Earth. Um, so, like, even down to things like what song they choose and what the episode title is play a role. And that's what I love about this show is you can watch it just as is, know nothing about it, know nothing about the context or the history or the actors or the Cohen movies, which they make tons of references to, and mm-hmm. you can still like it. But then there's all this other stuff that goes into it that you dig in more and you start to appreciate other you know, things that are deeper and things that, are, that make more sense. When when you look into them, it's like an onion with layers. Mm-hmm. To use a cliche, you know, one thing that as as a born and bred Minnesotan, one of the things that kept taking me out of the the story as I was trying to watch it was just these little teeny tiny Minnesota things that just weren't quite right. Mm-hmm. You know, that I would um, like someone calling soda soda and not pop or someone actually saying casserole instead of hot dish or like knowing where Bemidji is and that it's nothing like the town that they you know it's actually a college town and it's one of the bigger towns just little things like that would kind of be just I don't know I felt like they needed a better Minnesota consultant of some kind but they did get a lot of it just dead on too I mean the personalities of people and the accents is overdone as they are. And as much as that kind of, that always grates on me a little when I first start watching like the first episode, but 
then I think back and I, I've met people who talk with that thick of an accent. Like I, I actually know a woman named Marge Bundegaard. <laughs> <laughs> it is the most Minnesotan name I have ever heard. Just Marge Bundegaard. <laughs> and I was at work the other day thinking, you know, cause I'll always think, God, they're so like, I know we do that stuff, but it's so over the top. And then I'll catch myself saying things like, you know, Oh geez. I say, Oh geez all the time. And I didn't even notice it, but I'll be at work and drop something. And Oh geez. Like, I don't think I say you betcha that often. I, maybe I do, but it's funny to look at these little things that you don't even notice and realize, Oh shit. Yeah, I do do that. And just, kind of the passive aggressive nature of everybody and it it's as a minnesotan it's definitely very interesting to watch like one of the things that just didn't annoy me i guess but just constantly was in my head during season three is that st cloud and eden prairie if you lived in eden prairie you would not work in st cloud it's possible like you could but there's no reason that you would want to live in Eden Prairie and work in St. Cloud. And like, I get that they needed it for the mix up with the Eden Valley, but at the same time, it was just, uh, I don't know, that kind of pulled me out of it a little bit just because I know a lot about St. Cloud and I know, I know exactly where Eden Valley is. And, mm-hmm. but I, I you can't like expect the, everything to be perfect. But you know, if they are going to have a character as rich as uh, Emmett Stussy, of course mm-hmm. he's going to live in Eden Prairie or Edina. Like, that's just... I was going to say, I, I, it's more likely Edina that he would live in. But I, then I feel like also, if he were that, wouldn't he move his whole operation just to the Twin Cities somewhere? Like, why even have it in St. Cloud? Why, why just... I don't know. I feel like, yeah, when you do have that kind of money, just move it closer to where you work. <laughs> For people know. who don't live in Minnesota or don't know, like, Eden Prairie is at least an hour away from St. Cloud, um, maybe a little further. And to be fair, there are people that do that sort of commute, you know, especially from St. Cloud to the Twin Cities area. You just don't see it in reverse that often. You don't see somebody who works in the metro area traveling that distance to go work in outstate Minnesota somewhere. Mm Mm-hmm. But I, I also feel like Emmett Stussy would be someone who's like, this is the way it is. This is the way it was going to be. We started in St. Cloud. We're going to stay in St. Cloud. I don't, you know, I, so what if I have yeah. to commute? I have my own car. You know, it, it, it just seems mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, these character details, I, I agree. It's like getting mixed up Eden Valley, Eden Prairie, it, but it was by mm-hmm. a doofus. So right. I, I can also see that happening. But yeah. Um, you know, just having Minnesota represented in that way to someone who hasn't lived here all her life uh, mm-hmm. is, is also interesting to me because, I, I, you know, I wasn't raised here, but I've mm-hmm. been here long enough that I, I consider myself to be from here now. So uh, yeah. the, the biggest things that stand out to me is is how flat Duluth apparently is. Oh, my gosh. Right. And like, ha- yeah, no, <laughs> or, Duluth is just all hills and lake. That's the whole thing. It's or those uh, those yeah. big mountains in Bemidji uh, when they Ugh. when they have the uh, ice pond <laughs> scenes. So, <clears throat> yeah. I that kind of stuff I just end up fixating on and looking at and going, there's no mountains in Minnesota. That's just. <laughs> not how it works but you know i part of me you know see you know i say that all the time it's very minnesotan (laughs) part of me was a little i don't know if i want to say upset or just put off by the fact that you know i learned later that they shoot most of this in canada Mm -hmm. and i really feel like i'm sure they did make some sort of effort to shoot in minnesota i know they did that with the movie but from what i understand minnesota is actually a decent place to shoot films as far as what our tax codes are and you know that's what I had always heard anyway is that they film a lot of movies here because of that and I wonder why they made that decision I guess to not film here I'm sure it had to do with a financial reason or you know some sort of red tape but I don't know I feel like it would have been even more interesting to see them just on location somewhere and actually filming here in Minnesota but you know, Canada is basically the same as Minnesota anyway, so... I feel like what happened uh, with that was when they shot the movie, uh, they had issues with enough snow being on the ground. Uh, because for some reason, the Fargo world always has to have snow on the ground. Of course. So it might have had something to do with, you know, Alberta, 
Calgary area, Mm -hmm. probably having that consistent snow uh, or being more likely to. Um, Yeah. And I also feel like they portray small town Minnesota with a certain aesthetic. And, you know, they use the same town in all three seasons. Uh, Yeah. So I I think that was just more the vibe they were going for, which is also consistent with the movie, uh, which they portray the town you live in, right, Brainerd? Uh, Yep. So there you go. I mean... Um, but they, to be fair, they also portray St. Cloud as like this metropolitan area with skyscrapers. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, which there, is so not. There's some local conveniences that kind of have to be overlooked. Sure. I mean, just for the sake of the storyline. So, um, yeah, when, when the movie came out, that's why it was such a big deal was that it took place in Brainerd. And, and that was another thing, you know, f- from all of us who live here watching that movie, it was like, that's not the Blue Ox bar. That's not even close to what it's like. And that, you know, just seeing all these scenes, we don't even have a buffet in Brainerd. There's no way you'd be going to eat at a buffet. (laughs) So we all just got lost in all those little details because we, you know, like that's not our Paul Bunyan. That one's in Bemidji and that kind of stuff. Just, you know, you should just let... I assume if you're not from that exact town, it wouldn't bother you nearly as much. But right, but and, yeah, I know, just someone yeah. who's obsessed with Duluth, like I, I just, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I kind of sit there and go. Uh, other than superimposing the bridge into the opening shot in the first episode, uh, it, it's like oh, mm-hmm. that's really not Duluth, but whatever. Yeah, it looks nothing like Duluth, and mm-hmm. yeah, the St. Cloud scenes. That St. Cloud is very flat. It is very much a town that thinks it's a big city, and is very much not. It's kind of like, I see St. Cloud as a suburb that's just an hour further away. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole vibe. And it's, it's also very, very Catholic because yeah, I used to live there. (laughs) I'm surprised they don't portray religion more, I guess, in the show. They do to a certain extent, but you know, small town Midwest, there's a lot of religiosity here. And I don't know. Why do you think they didn't do more of that? Or am I missing some that they did do? A lot of it's subtle. I mean, the most overt example is having an actual purgatory in season right. three. But I think maybe it would interfere with a lot of the philosophical aspects they were going to. Because, um, mm-hmm. like I said, they have a lot of supernatural stuff going on. They have a lot of different theory and uh, different kinds of uh, things they were trying to accomplish. So I feel like mixing up both like that kind of religion and also mm-hmm. dealing with Jewish traditions and different kinds of Christian traditions and uh, beyond. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's more there than you think, but it's um, not as overt as it may be in certain areas of Minnesota. Right. Um, so another just random question I have, I, I don't know why I don't know this, but Wrench and Knuckles, are they Numbers. brothers? Numbers, 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 wrench and numbers. Are they brothers or are they just lifelong friends? And how did I never figure this out? I think they're just lifelong friends. Um, they they might be brothers. I don't think it's ever really established. But, you know, you have them as kids at the very end of season two. Right. And, you know, yeah. you have Hansi Dent turning into the mob boss from season one. So that's kind of, that kind mm-hmm. of establishes how they got there. Uh, right. You know, Hansi slash Moses Tripoli building his own family that... You know, he establishes, of course, is mm-hmm. eventually going to get taken over, which it does by Lauren Malvo. Um, right. So you have a family, but not family in a way. And then, of course, uh, that scene where Wrench shows back up in season three is amazing. Oh, one my, of my favorite God. Parts. That um, was so good. And seeing him and Nikki working together and, oh, it, yeah, it was fantastic. And, and and their little theme song, I just had to work into the play just because mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> there are just times where we'll be sitting around the house and just go, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many yeah. good characters there, and there's so many that are more than one dimensional. Uh, yes. The way they're written, the way they interact, uh, you know, even the parts that aren't necessarily realistic. I just feel like they do so much. And not just with the quote-unquote good guys, just with ev- pretty much everybody except some stock characters like the cop in season three. You know, one's a doof and one's an absolute misogynist 
awful person. So Mm -hmm. they have them. And that was the only character I felt that never really got the comeuppance he deserved, which felt odd within the context of the show. Um, Yeah. But I I would also say that season three grows on me the more times I see it. Uh, There's just so much going on um, that especially when you take in the current political climate, you can really see mm-hmm. how uh, close it was and what they were really trying to say, but did it in a way that yeah. wasn't like, this is Trump, this is Trump. <laughs> oh my God. I We have already started seeing the Trump 2020 signs here. Mm. It. I was on my way to a winter solstice party last night and we saw at least one business and at least three houses just on the way to that party that were Trump 2020. It's so, so frustrating and disgusting. Um, I think it would be fun. I don't know when I would ever possibly have the time to do this, but I think it would be super fun for us to go back and just do like episode recap podcasts at some point, just watch an episode and do a recap, even though it's an old show, you know, we, people could kind of watch along and watch the episode and because I love listening to those um, after show podcasts and I've never really done one but I think that might be fun to do sometime you know maybe my, if we did like one episode a month or something like we could make yeah. that work I'd be up for that totally I could do one episode a month that would be totally cool and I just because I love hearing just your take on it and getting all of those little things that I missed you know I I just don't know a lot of I I took literary theory in college, you know, so I understand that, but it's been hard for me to translate it into other kinds of media, you know, to see stuff popping up in TV shows or movies that are further beneath what the actual plain old storyline is. I don't Mm -hmm. know. And you've got so much more knowledge about it than I do. Well, and... Uh, that's one place where autism is kind of a superpower for me because mm. I, I don't yeah. get into a lot. But when I do, I have to know everything about it. Yeah. So uh, that, that's You're kind all of a in. benefit for that. But the, the top thing I can think of is just look at what the episode titles are, then look up what that is. And that alone, especially in season one, will do a lot to sort of uh, give you the way to delve in deeper. Yeah, I remember um, the last time I rewatched Mad Men all the way through, you know, when you're watching things a second or third time, you pick up on the things that you missed the first time you were watching it. And by the end of that series, I was 100% convinced that Don Draper was the literal devil. Like, he was just meant to be the actual devil. Because if you go back and watch it, there are so many references just to the devil in general, but the way that he interacts with people and it, and I remember thinking that going, Oh my God, I just had this epiphany. Don Draper is the devil. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, it's, yeah, if you go back and watch it, it becomes just obvious. Like, of course, the way that he is able to talk anybody into anything and, you know, they even have very overt references to it in the ad campaigns he does. And, but this is not a Mad Men podcast, I'm just <laughs> saying. I, I would love to have one of those epiphany moments with Fargo, too. So, yeah, maybe we should try to do that, and then we can get deeper into it and more specific episode by episode. And anybody who hasn't seen it can watch along, and I could just be the Minnesota critic and point out every single thing that they did wrong. Um, and, yeah, so do you have anything else you want to add to this before I go and make nachos because I'm starving? Uh, or... we, we didn't bring up one of the best parts of the entire show, which is the episode oh. where Nick Offerman chews the scenery, uh, completely oh. drunk out of his mind. Yes. <laughs> and just walks into the police station and just riffs the whole time. And it's just he like, just killed it. Out of my way, tool of the state, I am here to bring down the proverbial <laughs> justice that our forefathers... And it's just so good. Like, even if you've never seen the show, just look up Nick Offerman, oh, yeah, just Fargo, that. Police Station. Like, that alone is one Well, of and just him outside trying to hold off the other guys and trying... You can see him trying to project that confidence, but yet he also does a good job of the showing that inside he's scared shitless. Mm-hmm. But yet he's he's doing such a good job of just 
I, I have total confidence. And his that character, I just love. When I saw him come on the screen, I was like, Nick Offerman, oh my god, I'm going to love this. Because I love him in everything. But oh, he's great. He did such a great, his character was fantastic. Just the moment you find out he's a lawyer, you're like, wait, what? Because <laughs> you think he's just a guy drinking down at the VFW, just, you know, telling the same stories. But no, it turns out he's an actual lawyer. And... Yeah, so that was yeah. Any anything else you want to? I don't know. I, we could talk about this forever, but Which, yeah, it's Christmas Eve tomorrow, and if we do a podcast, then we could do. It. Well, see, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, you know, yeah, make it sort of a like a monthly thing. You know, if if we can do mm-hmm. one episode a month, uh, I feel like that'd yeah. be a fun little bonus thing you could. I think so too. Yeah, I think okay. we can totally do that. All right. Well, we will put that in the works. And in the meantime, thank you for coming on here and discussing this. I was in my car the other day going, I need to talk to somebody right now about this. And I thought, <laughs> okay, it's the middle of the day. Um, I still have to go to work and I should probably just schedule something. But yeah, when I see something like that, it's like, I, I just want to process immediately with somebody else, which is what after show podcasts are so good for. You can listen to somebody else processing the whole thing. And um, so, yeah, thank you for doing this. And I like you. I could talk about this show forever. So, (laughs) well, and eventually we're going to have to have that episode about how Broadway musicals are 100% better than Star Trek or Star Wars, because I think, I think we decided we're the only two people in the atheist community (laughs) that just don't care about Star Wars and Star Trek, especially Star Trek. Oh, my God. Like, I, Everybody I, is so into it. Yeah. And, you know, I I try not to begrudge anybody who likes those things. But at the same time, sure. I'm so sick of that Star Wars theme. I could puke like I just I yeah, <laughs> I can't stand it. I really can't. It's, it's it's the most black and white boring story I've ever seen. But people act like it's the second coming of Hamlet. So it's it's, well, it's like it's become its own religion. And mm-hmm. it's just and when you don't when you just don't care about it. and don't, But everybody thinks that if you just got into it a little bit more, you'd get it like, no, I really wouldn't. Whereas, you know, Broadway musicals. Oh, my God. Every I want to get everybody to love them. And I'm the same way with that as they are with Star Trek. Like, if you just see the right one, you're going to love it. And just watch this clip and listen. to. So I'm sure I am just as exhausting on the other end uh, to people who don't care about Broadway musicals. But I think that would be a fun, fun episode to have, too, because, yeah, (laughs) we're both more theater nerds and not Star Trek nerds. So get ready to watch episode one over again, because we're going to. I will be because I ran out of shows to binge anyway. So (laughs) I'll just have to start over. (laughs) Thank you for coming on. Do a a Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or I don't know. What are your preferred holiday greetings? I don't really do any. I don't really celebrate. Merry Festivus. So yeah. Um, so check out the holiday play. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 On and that is going to be on Atheist Talk and on your show, right? Yeah. Is or was it released on my feed today? So um, okay, perfect. Yeah, you can listen to the whole thing there and get what all these Fargo references are. And you know that character being obsessed with Fargo, not that far off. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I will, and I'll put a link when I release this episode i'll make sure i put links in the show notes so people can go right to it and listen to it it was fun recording that um marissa wrote a character just for me that's basically me Mm -hmm. and i still had a hard time pulling it off no you didn't oh my god i know i have such imposter syndrome but yeah the everybody did great it was so funny and people need to check that out because it was yeah you did a great job writing it and acting in it and yeah i love it i think editing was the most fun because like you heard ari's character like they sent me three takes of every scene and i'm just like how do i choose these are amazing (laughs) they're all so good Mm -hmm. i know at the beat when i first started recording mine i was like okay i'm gonna give her three different ones and i would say it once and then say it again and by the end of them i'm like just rambling (laughs) (laughs) like here, just use whatever. You, I don't know. I can't. It's. I'm too tired now. I don't know what I'm even talking about. And which was yeah, the character, I, so it worked out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I could just be tired, and I loved 
you know, the, at the end when everybody introduces themselves, I love that you put the <laughs> part in with me about being typecast as a character. And I, I thought that was funny. So yeah, everybody check it out. It is a great, even if you don't like the holidays and you hate Christmas, this is probably the play for you because it's, it's kind of the anti-Christmas play. It really um, is. It's called Have a Very Meta Christmas and everybody will love it. And yeah, I guess that's it for us. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to say goodbye and have any last thoughts for now? Uh, not really. Uh, not really? We're, okay. We're going to say hello again soon. So <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, it was fun talking to you, and I will see you soon. And thanks to everybody for listening. Yep. Bye. Bye.